Being seen and standing out with sophisticated, creative and compelling advertising is crucial for companies and nonprofit organizations to achieve their goals and to be successful. Therefore, one of the most fundamental questions for communication practitioners and researchers is what are the ingredients for truly impactful advertisements? In modern advertising, visual communication has become increasingly important. We have witnessed a remarkable shift in advertising over the last 70 years. As evidenced by multiple studies, the emphasis on images over words has continuously increased, leading to a prevalence of visual communication. As a result, imagery often communicates the key message of the ad, while the verbal text explains or anchors the meaning of the image. Therefore, understanding visual communication has become key to understanding persuasion in an advertising. And in particular, visual rhetorical figures have shown to be enormously effective to influence attitudes, intentions and even behaviors. But how do visual rhetorical figures work and what are potential pitfalls when using them? We will touch upon and discuss these questions in the following minutes. However, let's get out of this scene first. So with that being done, I would like to welcome you to this virtual talk. My name is Fabienne Bünzli and I'm a research associate and a PhD candidate at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. ABC, the Association for Business Communication, invited me to give a virtual talk as a response to the coronavirus pandemic, which is currently affecting the lives of us all. So today I have the pleasure to give this talk about visual rhetorical figures in advertising. But before we dive into the topic, let me first give you an overview of this talk. First, we're going to have a look at the basics and discuss what are all visual rhetorical figures, how relevant they are in advertising and how they work. Second, we're going to have a detailed look at how to classify and identify different types of visual rhetorical figures based on their meaning operation and their visual complexity. And third, we address how visual complexity influences the persuasiveness of visual rhetorical figures. So with that being said, let's start with the basics. On this slide, you can see two ads. The ad on the right contains a visual rhetorical figure, the ad on the left doesn't. But why is that? The ad on the right shows a tiger that is caged in a zoo. Such images are what we call a straightforward image. Straightforward images are matter-of-fact depictions of reality and can therefore be interpreted literally. In other words, what is shown is also what is meant. In contrast, the ad on the left cannot be interpreted literally. We see a swarm of fishes whereby one of the fishes is fused with a panda. When we look at this image, we realize that something's wrong here. We see that two things are put together that don't belong together at all. Rhetorical figures are concerned with the relationship of one thing to another. They are like puzzles that need to be resolved because they present two elements in a way that artfully deviates from expectation. What this image really means needs to be inferred from the pattern of reasoning that is present in this image. An interpretation of the ad might be that some endangered species receive more attention than others, although all of these animals need our help. Hence, a rhetorical figure is defined as an artful deviation from expectation that is not rejected as faulty, although literal interpretations would be nonsensical or at least untrue. We do not perceive such deviations as errors because they adhere to identifiable templates that are limited in number. For instance, a metaphor requires to compare unlike things to see one object in the light of the other. Or hyperboles exaggerate something for emphasis. Through repeated exposure to these templates over time, we have gained the competencies to respond to rhetorical figures and to understand them. And this learning allows rhetorical figures to channel inferences and to delimit the range of possible interpretations. Important to note is that rhetorical figures can be verbally or visually expressed. Our interest lies on the latter, 
that is visual rhetorical figures. By guiding our attention towards particular elements in the image and by relying on specific templates, rhetorical figures evoke arguments and lines of reasonings. This allows visual rhetorical figures to potentially stand alone without text. But how relevant are visual rhetorical figures in advertising? The evidence speaks a clear language. Not only has the frequency of visual rhetorical figures drastically increased over the past 70 years, also has advertising become predominantly visual. In this context, some even speak about a pictorial turn that has taken place in advertising. A reason for this trend is that older ads presume an attentive reader, while more recent ads assume a visually oriented and casually browsing viewer. The following examples illustrate how much advertising has changed within the last decade and how it looked back then in the 1950s. Over 50 years lie between these ads. And as you can see here, the difference is striking. In the 1950s, advertising was heavily text-centered and images were used to support what the text said and therefore mainly had an accompanying function. Visual rhetorical figures were rare or almost never used because the dominant view was that images should accurately depict objects that they referenced. Pictures that deviate from reality or from our expectation were regarded as distortions or deceptions and were therefore avoided. Moreover, the photo editing tools were much more limited back then. This might have made it more difficult to create a sophisticated visual rhetorical figures. So over the years, the text image ratio has changed and images have become the dominant element in advertising. And as you can see here, some ads even come without any verbal copy at all. The entire message of the ad is conveyed by the image, which contains a visual rhetorical figure. The ad might be interpreted as saying that using this uh, detergent is a good idea because it makes your laundry clean and fresh. So, but why do advertisers increasingly use visual rhetorical figures? And what is their advantage over straightforward images? So the short answer is that visual rhetorical figures have shown to be more persuasive than straightforward images. And the longer answer is that their superior persuasiveness works through so-called tension and relief processes. When we look at an image which includes a visual rhetorical figure, we realize that something's wrong or that it's not an accurate depiction of reality. This initial incongruity of rhetorical figures induces tension and invites us to resolve the puzzle. And resolving the puzzle is rewarding and prompts what, for example, semiotics literature describes as pleasure of the text. In other words, understanding an initially incomprehensible message evokes the pleasurable experience of finally getting it. Thus, we can think of visual rhetorical figures as puzzles. Perceiving the process of going through the ad as pleasurable makes it more likely that recipients have a favorable attitude towards the ad and toward the advocacy. But obviously, for pleasure to arise, the puzzle needs to be successfully resolved. And if people fail to come up with a meaningful interpretation and understand the visual rhetorical figure, they are likely to experience frustration or even anger. This in turn translates into decreased persuasion. The implication for advertisers is that if they use visual rhetorical figures, they should make sure that their target audiences are actually able to resolve the puzzle. This might depend on a number of factors, such as audiences' prior knowledge about a topic their motivation to more thoughtfully engage with the topic or their cognitive capacities. Moreover, there are particular types of visual rhetorical figures which increase or decrease the likeliness that people figure out the meaning of a visual rhetorical figure. We will discuss this aspect more in depth later. So despite these potential pitfalls, 
visual rhetorical figures have shown to influence both the precursors of persuasion and persuasion itself. An accumulating body of research shows that ads with rhetorical figures not only attract more attention than straightforward ads, but also increase the extent and the depth of processing and the elaboration of an ad. And most importantly, rhetorical figures have also shown to increase persuasion, including attitudes, intentions and behaviors. So we have elaborated what are visual rhetorical figures and we understand how they work. But we don't know yet what types of visual rhetorical figures there are. And having clear-cut typologies is fundamental for both communication research and practice. First, systematizing different types of visual rhetorical figures helps to manage complexity and to gain a better understanding of the subject. Second, typologies help to make more precise predictions about the effects of visual rhetorical figures. As we will see later, typologies provide the foundations to understand under which conditions certain types of visual rhetorical figures might be more or less persuasive. The probably most popular and widely used typology was developed by Phillips and Macquarie and uh, published in 2004. The typology is structured along two axes, visual richness and visual complexity. Visual richness describes the degree of polysemy of a visual rhetorical figure. It is determined by meaning operation, which refers to the way that the two elements that constitute a rhetorical figure are linked to each other. The typology differentiates between three meaning operations. So in the meaning operation of connection, recipients are guided to establish a link between two depicted elements. A is associated with B because. In meaning operation of comparison, Recipients are guided to compare two elements with each other. A is like B because, or A is not like B because. According to Phillips and Macquarie, the meaning operation of comparison is richer than the meaning operation of connection. Because answering how is A like B or how is A not like B is expected to generate a broader set of inferences than answering how is A associated with B. The second axis is concerned with the visual complexity of a visual rhetorical figure. Visual complexity refers to the demands an image places on the recipients to process the ad. Complexity is determined by the structure of an ad and refers to the way two elements that comprise the visual rhetorical figure are physically pictured in the ad. The least complex way to arrange two elements is to juxtapose them side by side. A more complex structure includes fusing two elements together. And the most complex way to organize two elements is to replace one element by the other. The element that is present calls to mind the element that is absent. I will now illustrate the different types of visual rhetorical figures using real ads as examples. This ad shows a visual rhetorical figure with a juxtaposition structure. We see that two things are put side by side which normally don't go together. We would never expect a penguin standing in front of a city that is built within a desert because this is far from the natural habitat. Penguins are considered uh, marine birds and spend up to 80% of their lives in the sea. Moreover, the meaning operation of connection is used to establish a link between the penguin and the city in the desert. The penguin is put in front of the city to point out the consequences of climate change. Because of climate change and global warming, the penguin finds itself in a man-made world where water scarcity is a reality and where there is no place for animals. This ad here shows a dolphin with a protective mask. Again, this ad uses the meaning operation of connection to establish a link between the dolphin and the mask. 
The dolphin wears a mask because the water is polluted. The visual structure is somewhat different because here the dolphin and the mask are not juxtaposed to each other, but instead they are melted together. This is what Phillips and McQuarrie refer to as fusion. This ad uses a replacement as visual structure. The overdimensioned plastic ball calls to mind a stranded marine mammal. The plastic ball resembles a stranded marine mammal through its form, the way it lies on a beach and the way people gather around and pour water over it. And just like the former ads, this visual rhetorical figure works through connection. The message is not that the stranded mammal is like a plastic bottle. Instead, the image articulates that the marine mammal was killed because it mistaked plastic for food. Here we see a visual rhetorical figure which juxtaposes elements. It shows two fishes and a plastic bag. And the way that the fishes and the plastic bags are arranged side by side resembles a food chain, with the plastic bag being the biggest predator. The meaning operation here is what Phillips and McQuarrie termed a similarity. The plastic bag is like a predator. In this ad, a drink can is fused with a grenade. The ad conveys that throwing away waste kills thousands of marine creatures. Accordingly, the drink can and the grenade are linked by similarity. The image suggests that the drink can is like a grenade. This ad shows two forests, one of them being damaged. The shape of the two forests calls to mind human lungs. And the image's message is that we are destroying our planet's lungs by destroying forests. What follows is that the image also uses a similarity meaning operation. It articulates that the forest functions as lungs for the world. The following three ads all include figures of oppositions. The seahorse and the toothbrush are juxtaposed. At first glance, we might think that the image depicts two seahorses. But at second glance, we realize that the alleged seahorse on the right is in fact a toothbrush. The ad can be interpreted as saying that waste might be as colorful as marine creatures and might even look similar, but that it can never replace them. I have shown you this ad at the beginning of the video. Taking a look at it again, we understand that the two elements, so the fish and the panda, are linked by opposition. These fishes are not like pandas, because they don't receive the same amount of attention or concern. The last ad shows a replacement by a position figure. Because obviously the image is saying that waste is not like real animals. The waste calls to mind a swarm of fishes and points to the fact that our oceans are more and more polluted by waste. So far, we have seen how to categorize different types of visual rhetorical figures. But do these types also differ in their persuasive effects? Particularly one dimension, namely the visual complexity dimension, has received attention from research. Some scholars argued that more complexity leads to greater persuasion. The underlying assumption is that increases in complexity produces greater tension because the image places higher cognitive demands on the recipients. The resolution of the image puzzle should therefore be more rewarding. So put differently, the more effort it costs to interpret the rhetorical figure, the more pleasure of processing the rhetorical figure may yield. However, findings from previous research indicates that the complexity is only pleasurably arousing within limits. A recent study provides evidence that the effects of visual complexity form an inverted U-curve, with fusions being the tipping point. Ads with replacement figures yielded similarly low attitude scores than ads with straightforward images. The explanation offered was that replacement figures were too complex to be understood and that this decreased comprehension which then translated into decreased processing pleasure and ad liking. 
This implies that caution is warranted when using visual rhetorical figures. If a figure is too complex, it might fail to produce the desired effect because people just don't understand what the image wants to say and get frustrated as a consequence. So overall, what are the key takeaways from this talk? First, I wanted to outline why visual rhetorical figures merit our, our attention. We have seen that advertising has become increasingly visual and that many ads rely on visual rhetorical figures. Moreover, I have explained why rhetorical figures have been consistently found to be more persuasive than straightforward images. When we look at an image which includes a visual rhetorical figure, we realize that something is wrong and that it is not an accurate depiction of reality. And this initial incongruity induced by rhetorical figures induces tension and invites us to resolve the puzzle. And when we are able to resolve the puzzle, we experience the pleasurable feeling of finally getting it. Second, I presented a typology that helps to identify and classify different types of visual rhetorical figures. I have also addressed the effects of these types of visual rhetorical figures and pointed out that highly complex figures might be counterproductive and even decrease persuasion. And before we get to the end of this talk, I would like to point out some questions that I think could be worth addressing in the future. From a research perspective, it would be important to explore the interplay between visual rhetorical figures and verbal anchoring. For instance, it is still unclear what amount of verbal anchoring is most persuasive. Should ads completely spell out the meaning of a visual rhetorical figure, only give a hint at the meaning of the figure, or provide no verbal copy at all? And particularly, does the complexity of a visual rhetorical figure influence what amount of verbal anchoring is most effective? From a practitioner's perspective, it might be worth to reflect on best practices to develop compelling and sophisticated visual rhetorical figures. What are different approaches and techniques and what has worked particularly well or not? Furthermore, it may also be important to think about whether there are any specific topics, services or social issues for which visual rhetorical figures might be inappropriate. Also, it might be interesting to consider to what extent people respond differently to visual rhetorical figures based on their cultural background. So with that being said, I would like to thank you for your attention, for your interest and for your persistence to watch the full video. If you have any comments or questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. I will be happy to reply to your feedback. And last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to the ABC YouTube channel if you haven't yet. And thanks again for watching and bye.